Hello, welcome to Just the Dis. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And I have the new discs box, and it is full of stuff. And I'm gonna start right talking about them because I don't want to take your time too long here. So let's kick it off with some crazy action goodness from Seven Films. This is Strike Commando, uh, directed by. Uh, Ruggiero Diodato, written by Clyde Anderson, a.k.a. Claudio Fragasso, who, of course, uh, wrote uh, and directed Troll 2, but also wrote things like Night Killer, which is an amazing movie, also put out by Severn on Blu-ray. Highly entertaining. And um, this, of course, stars the great Reb Brown, who folks may remember from a little movie called Your Hunter from the Future, which I actually prefer to this, but... This is very enjoyable. Um, Yor is a sort of futuristic take on Conan, but it's uh, something else. Yor is completely in its own universe, uh, quite literally. And uh, this is much more of a Rambo riff, if you will. It's kind of like if you if you think of what the movie that uh, the guy who made Troll 2 and Night Killer... Uh, would write and the director of Cruel Jaws uh, coming together to do a Rambo ripoff. Well, it's not, I mean, it kind of is, it kind of is its own thing, but coming together to make that movie, that's what Strike Commando is, okay? And it's, everything is like turned up to an 11. Um, this has an extended cut of the film, which is what I watched. I didn't go back and rewatch the theatrical cut to get a sense of what was uh, left in in the extended. Um, but there's a lot of Vietnam stuff, and it's, you know, Red Brown getting captured and being tortured, like, quite relentlessly, almost to the point that it becomes funny, and then it stops being funny and gets, like, really dark again. Like I said, everything's turned up to 11. Uh, Red Brown and his Strike Commando team uh, are very good at what they do, but in this case, they you know, he gets captured and, uh, it becomes a whole thing. But yeah, just seeing him, you know, being Reb and, uh, he's got a very specific acting style and Claudio Fragasso's dialogue is, I find it very entertaining. I think it's this kind of dialogue that is not the way humans speak, but the way, uh, someone might interpret a movie like it's kind of what like what they think a movie should sound like or something I don't even know how to quantify it um but all that said it's very entertaining to listen to and to watch play out and Reb Brown you know is very big in parts in this and he's screaming and yelling uh a lot in this which is another thing that makes me think of Rambo in a way but um for whatever reason, I had known about this movie for decades and, or not decades, like a decade or so. Uh, I think I heard about it on the Gentleman's Guide to Midnight Cinema podcast probably, you know, 11 years ago or something. And there was never really a great copy available and so I just never got around to it. And so I'm glad I waited because this Blu-ray looks great. Uh, and it has uh, an interview with uh, Claudio Fragasso and it has... Uh, in an uh, interview with the other co-writer. It's not just him, and there's two guys involved. So you have two interviews and multiple cuts of the film. And um, does it have... No. It's no uh, alternate artwork. Um, but I would definitely count it as a fun discovery and a movie that I enjoyed. Uh, if you like crazy Rambo-type action, it's not quite Deadly Prey good, but it's you know, in that conversation, I think. Um, so, of course, they also brought out Strike Commando 2, which is interesting because it looks like Reb Brown on the cover, but uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's But it's the same team. Uh, it says director Bruno Mattei and co-screenwriter Claudio Fragasso and Rossella Drudi returned to the Philippine jungles, which, of course, is where Strike Commando 1 was shot. Um, with a higher budget, bigger action, and Richard Harris. Yes, that Richard Harris. Uh, so this one has a higher profile cast. For a crowd pleaser that shamelessly borrows from Apocalypse Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Rambo, and beyond. Uh, this time, Sergeant Mike Ransom. I forgot to mention 
the name of the character, Mike Ransom. I think it's a great name. They just keep saying Ransom. Is he that good? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, he's played by Brent Huff of Gwendolyn. Uh, battles the KGB, rogue CIA agents, and an army of ninjas, a tough bar owner, and all the stuntman craziness and explosions you can cram into 90 minutes. Uh, and Vic Diaz in the slow motion machine gun, uh, Matai Mayhem, that's just as insane as his predecessor. I agree with that. I didn't like it as much, but I agree with that. Um, and it was neat to have Richard Harris in the mix. Uh, and it's just neat that they did both of these movies at the same time. So I'm, I'm into that. Uh, this one has some uh, interview, another interview with Claudio Fergasso, and uh, an interview with Brent Huff, who plays... Uh, Mike Ransom in this film I would have liked I definitely would have liked it more if it had Reb Brown because Reb Brown was sort of the heart of that one and the movie suffers a bit not having him but that said it's a bit crazier even than the first one so worth checking out uh, Strike Commander 1 and 2 from Severin and then um, there was a little sale uh, around uh, Amazon Prime Day and I, I didn't pick up a lot but um, I did get this. This was on sale for like $10.99. I'm a big fan of it, but I've actually become more and more and more of a fan each time I watch it. Each time I see it, I I understand more and more why it is such a beloved film. And this 4K looks good. I mean, it's still a very grainy, you know, older 70s movie, but um, it looks good. And it has, of course, Burt Reynolds and, uh, you know, you have uh, Jerry Reed in some of the best buddy chemistry in 70s cinema. I just think the two of them together, the bandit and um, uh, Cletus, I always remember his name, um, just their little mission that they've been given um, to transport uh, like 400 cases of Coors beer across state lines and it's never been done before and just the challenge of it and the way that it's presented with um you know uh, Paul Williams and the, the big Enos little Enos the whole thing it's just a great setup and a great movie and it's got a great pace and it just keeps trucking along pun not intended but uh Sally Field is great in this and the other thing I love about it and I forgot is one thing I don't love is when movies back Sally Field into the corner of having to be um, sort of a sad, hysterical mess. Like that's a that's a gimmick or a thing that a lot of movies have her do, and maybe it's one of the things she likes doing. And I know a lot of people find it funny. I just don't. I've never really been amused by Sally Field getting hysterical. And I thought she did in this movie, but it doesn't really happen much. She's just a cool customer in this. And she and Bert get along really well. And so I really dug that she didn't go there in this one. And I'd forgotten that. And of course, Jackie Gleason, you know, as Sheriff Buford T. Justice is is pretty great. Um, he's pretty funny and his timing is very solid. And his car just continues to get more and more destroyed as you go through the movie. And that's very, very fun to watch too. But yeah, just a really great movie. Like I just, I, I remembered it was obligatorily on HBO uh, and so I guess I, I saw it as something of a movie that was like, I don't know, maybe not high art and it isn't in a way, uh, Hal Needham is directing and I think he's a pretty great action and stunt director, obviously he comes from that world and there's some great car stunts in the movie, um, and great driving in general, just really great fast driving. Um, but it's, to me, it's becoming more and more of a classic, you know, like, you know, you wouldn't there was a time when I wouldn't have put it in league with like the French connection or something, but in a way it's like that kind of a towering achievement. I think because it's a comedy and sort of a backwoods hillbilly comedy at that, it gets marginalized by a lot of people, including myself. But again, each time I watch it, I like it more. So point being is this was worth like 10 bucks or 10, 11 bucks. Really great. And also 10 bucks was, the um, three movie collection, which I haven't busted open yet, but which of course has Smokey and the Bandit 2 and the um, much more divisive uh, Smokey and the Bandit Part 3, uh, which I haven't watched in a while. Um, and it has a making of. And oh, this has a ton of great special features that you can't even list all on the back. And there's 
just a lot going on in that. So anyway, Smokey and the Bandit Fest I kind of had at my house. And um, what else have we got? Um, Alley Cat. This is from uh, Vinegar Syndrome. I talked about this one briefly um, when I opened the you know package uh, for J May. I, now I can't remember if it's June or... Anyway, uh, I hadn't seen this one. It I've called. I heard it called a you know female death wish, um, but in watching it, uh, I dug it. You know, it was it was pretty solid. Um, the lead gal is played by. Now I'm not going to find it on the back, of course, but um, she's she's quite good, and the movie doesn't go. To some of the dark and sleazier places that I thought it's it's a bit and and maybe some people would find this a detriment but it's a bit more tame than I expected. Um, but that said, she beats a lot of dudes up quite well, and right from the beginning too. And so that's pretty cool to see when you're just like, uh oh, where's this going? And suddenly she's just throwing people around and just punching people. And it was like I said, enjoyable stuff. This is a VSA title. I'm glad I picked it up. I won't go too deep into that one, but uh, next we have Last Train from Gun Hill. This is from Paramount Presents. This is a Western uh, directed by the great John Sturges, who, of course, did uh, The Great Escape, Bad Day at Black Rock, Magnificent Seven. This one takes place, I want to say, before all of those. Uh, it is from, I want to say it's, oh, 59. So same year as Rio Bravo. You could go see Last Train from Gun Hill. And it's a really great, tense movie because the story is basically... The stars are Kirk Douglas and Anthony Quinn, as you can see there. And it's got a great setup in that um, film follows U.S. Marshal Matt Morgan, that's Kirk Douglas, on the trail of his wife's killer. Uh, adding a dark twist to the tale the suspect's father is Morgan's longtime friend cattle baron Craig Belden Anthony Quinn Morgan is determined to capture the killer and take him away by the nine o'clock train against all odds so basically you know his wife is raped and murdered at the beginning of the movie um I think his son is too I, his son is with him is with the wife I can't remember if the son is killed or not uh right now but regardless it's a very personal vendetta and he there's a very fancy saddle that um, one of the you know attackers leaves behind and it's such a fancy saddle like with all this silver and beautiful beautiful design and uh, it's monogrammed and it's monogrammed with you know Anthony Quinn's name on it and he knows it wasn't Anthony Quinn but he knows it could be his no good son and so he's pretty sure of himself and he goes down to talk to him and one thing he, oh, the son, that's right. The son did make it because the son saw uh, that she sliced the face of the guy that attacked her. And so immediately when the Anthony Quinn son returns from his little escapade, everybody notices he's got a big slice in his face, like a big one that you can't hide. And so that is the true giveaway. And so it becomes this real you know, standoff between Quinn and Douglas, you know, Quinn understands that Douglas is upset, but he's like, it's my son, man. So where it goes, I think is very interesting, uh, beautiful Vista vision movie and, um, has a nice, uh, filmmaker focus with, uh, Leonard Malton, as you can see there, probably about eight minutes, I think, but, uh, I enjoy those little short conversations. Leonard always packs a lot into him. Uh, so that is last train from gun Hill. Of course, this has the, um, fold out slip. Um, okay. A couple keynotes here. Last Married Couple in America. This is from 1980. Um, I want to say this is sort of a successor to Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. It's not nearly on that level, but it is dealing with like three or four married couples. And in, in, in the case of Bob and Carol, it's obviously two. Um, but they're, you know, together and they're all sort of struggling in their marriages, and we open with a scene of them playing football, which I think is kind of cool, actually, uh, couples playing football. Just, you know, uh, touch football in a park, um, and it's like a married couple activity, and I think that's kind of neat. You see that in movies occasionally, 
Um, couples like, maybe used to do it in the 70s. I don't know. I, I haven't ever played touch football with other married couples, but um, but it is interesting. So you see all the couples at the beginning, and then and then slowly, you know, the other couples are played by folks like, um, well, okay, so it's George Siegel and Natalie Wood are the main couple. Uh, but then like Richard Benjamin, Valerie Harper, Bob Dishy, Dom DeLuise to an extent, uh, Priscilla Barnes, and um, I can't remember who all the different couples are. I know Richard Benjamin is one of part of one of them. But anyway, they they all start to get divorced, and George Siegel's character is really struggling with um, keeping you know the idea of what marriage should be and how how it should keep going. And like Bob Dishy at the beginning is giving this whole speech about how mon- monogamy is just dead and it's you know ridiculous concept and all these things. And so it's just them. It's comedic, but it's also kind of emotional in spots and silly, you know, kind of outlandish and and silly the way Bob and Carol can be in spots. Um, So again, it's not nearly as good, uh, but I do find it interesting in a movie that I feel like not a lot of people have seen because it wasn't available for a long time. There was an MOD DVD. Now we have this Blu-ray, which looks good. Uh, and it has a commentary by film historian Lee Gambin, which uh, I dig. He's a good guy. Um, so if you're into that sort of, you know, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice vibe, and, you know, you want something along those lines, um, this is interesting. And Dom DeLuise, uh, very interesting in that his character is like a porn star. He's become sort of a porn actor, and that's a whole thing. And, and Richard Benjamin's like really good as this um, married guy who is kind of cynical, especially after his divorce, and he's sort of whispering in uh, George Siegel's ear. They have, you know, lunches, and, you know, he's he's trying to... I, I think he would like to see, you know, George Siegel's marriage fail, and so it's an interesting friendship, antagonistic thing they have. Uh, but good cast and an enjoyable, underseen film. And one more from Kino. This is The Plainsman. Of 1936, directed by Cecil B. DeMille. Um, this is the story of, uh, you know, basically it's Wild Bill Hickok, played by uh, Gary Cooper, Calamity Jane, played by Gene Arthur, and uh, let's see, Buffalo Bill Cody, played by James Ellison. And so the story. It says here, um, Hickok helps to pacify the frontier in a period of immense change for the Old West. At the same time, behind the scenes, we see the political decisions undertaken by President Lincoln that gradually shape America in the period after Civil War. Um, yeah, so the beginning of the movie, we see, um, you know, Civil War has ended. Lincoln is talking to his cabinet or his uh, administration and saying, we need to we have all these men coming back from the civil war. They won't have jobs. It's going to be completely overwhelming basically and economically. So we need to encourage people to go West and we need to make the frontier safe. And that's the last thing he says. And then Mary Todd walks in the room and says, Oh, we got to go to the Ford theater to see a play. So obviously we know he is killed that night. And we have some folks that sort of take away from that idea of, we need to make the frontier safe. Um, some take it the wrong way. And we cut to sort of this meeting of a bunch of gun manufacturers who are now like our product is we have all this product and we have no place to go with it. Um, we have a guy that will sell our repeating rifles to the Indians, to the native Americans. And they, you know, that's a good option for us. You know, whereas one guy's like, what about what Lincoln said? And, um, you know, they'll use it to kill the settlers and, and so there's this weird undercurrent of politics that comes into play. And then we sort of have uh, Bill Hick- Bill Hickok coming out of the war himself and running into while Bill Cody or Bill Bill Cody and he's married now and settling down. But they clearly have a history together, and they keep getting pulled into these um, dealings with the army, where like I think Ulysses Grant, I'm forgetting which general it is. Um, requires them to assist, or at least Bill Cody to assist in getting some ammunition to a certain fort that's like a key stronghold against the tribes that are warring against um, people trying to move west. And so we have some stuff with the Indians where, um, where you know, uh, 
Hickok has sort of a vendetta with one particular chief and that comes into play and there's like standoffs and stuff. Uh, I thought it was pretty good, um, you know, and and definitely tries to be somewhat true to the story of Bill Hickok in some sense. And obviously there's a lot of invented stuff, but um, but, you know, a good performance from Gary Cooper. And I always love uh, Jean Arthur. So she's a lot of fun in this, too. But, you know, um, a, a good, tense uh, adventure story with some comedic moments and great performances and uh, I enjoyed it I'd heard it was good I remembered a an old universal VHS tape the one that had Gene, Gene Shalit's face on it like it was like Gene Shalit recommends and it was like this film strip of Gene Shalit like smiling in different poses and some VHS tapes were, I wish I could remember the other I feel like Lady Eve or something was one of them like he had this line Gene Shalit did of these Universal movies, and this was one of them, and it was one I always meant to see, so glad I got that, and it also has a great commentary from film critic Simon Abrams, uh, and author Simon Abrams, uh, so definitely a worthwhile overall package for this disc, which it's you know never been on Blu-ray that I'm aware of. And then last, I've got a couple from Mill Creek. Uh, Toy Soldiers was the big one I was waiting for that... I have from a 101 Films import from the UK, but this is, I think, the first domestic release on Blu-ray of Toy Soldiers, which is a great uh, die-hard at prep school kind of movie. Uh, and then a movie called December, which I'd never seen before. Um, but yeah, Toy Soldiers is really the selling point here. It's got, um, of course, as you can see, uh, Sean Astin, Keith Coogan, Will Wheaton, and others as these kind of well-to-do kids whose academy, which is run by Lou Gossett Jr., um, gets um, taken over by terrorists who want to ransom some of the, the kids in the school because they have ties to very important people, political higher-ups, the mob, um, and then it becomes sort of a, an FBI army negotiation kind of thing. And, and it's, you know, very enjoyable. I, it's a nineties from, I want to say it's from like 1991, but I always think of it as like an eighties movie. Really. It feels like an eighties movie or a holdover from that period. And, um, so a movie I've always, uh, enjoyed and I like the camaraderie between the kids and how they take on this, you know, threat of these terrorists and stuff. And so very solid. Um, December I hadn't seen, but it's interesting because it's um. Uh, it says three best friends facing the most important decision of their lives on December seventh, nineteen forty one, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor and changed the course of history for the five prep students in New Hampshire. Uh, the war had seemed a world away, but a savage surprise attack now brought the war home. So you have these kids. Will Wheaton is in this one as well, uh, as well as um. Balsar Getty, Jason London, Chris Young. Um, and so it's just sort of them struggling with the idea of what to do. Like there's going to be um, a big, you know, mass enlistment. Like a lot of kids are going to go off to the war. And some of these kids are trying to decide if that's what they really want to do. And the ones that do want to do it are kind of like, well, why wouldn't you? What's wrong with you? And so it becomes sort of this, it's not like a stage play, but it is a bit more contained in a way. And, and that's sort of the major drama, although there is more stuff at play here, but that's sort of the setup. Uh, but it's interesting. And I like that cast and, you know, it's no toy soldiers, but I think it'll be neat that people will get to see it because I had never seen it. Um, it is in a four by three aspect ratio, which I thought maybe, oh, is it a TV movie? But no, I don't think so. So um, toy, toy soldiers is widescreen, but this one is four by three, uh, just as a note. And this is only one disc and not two. So you're putting two movies on one disc for those that are anti that, but that's the only way to get toy soldiers. And then I've got one that's a DVD, but I really want to mention it because, um, I had seen some episodes of the critic, uh, and this show is like a na late nineties show, which I feel would be a huge hit now in the in the age of streaming um i mean and you can stream this i think on crackle if you want to check it out first but uh from the producers of the simpsons i want to say um 
a couple of the main creative folks behind The Simpsons are involved. Judd Apatow is involved. Um, and it stars John Lovitz from SNL as Jay Sherman, a New York-based uh, movie, movie critic. Uh, and he has his own cable show. And the show has a great opening where, you know, certain things happen. They, they have, like, some kind of bad setup. Like, he'll get a bad phone call from his parents. Like, we're taking you out of the will. or And... And then he sort of goes down to the theater or or whatever, and we get to see a fake movie. And the, the neat thing is that I think every episode they show a scene from another fake movie that looks like The Sound of Music or it looks like uh, Rambo or something, but they're doing some kind of parody. And at the end of it, he says his catchphrase, which of course is, it stinks. And it's just, I remembered liking it, but... I also, oh, Brad Bird, I think, is involved as a, some kind of advisor on this. I'm, I can't remember how. Maybe he directs some episodes later, but uh, it's just way funnier than I remembered. And I, I think the other thing is I thought since it's from the 90s, the jokes wouldn't play as funny as now. But they do a great thing in that they, you know, I think all the movies that he actually reviews, which is sometimes part of the show, are like made up movies and they're movie parodies. So it's like, in UHF when they do Conan the Librarian or Gandhi 2. I mean, except these are funnier. And so him critiquing these silly movies and in a way critiquing Hollywood in general, um, I, I still think works. I still think it's very funny. And so the movie, the show has uh, not, I want to say timeless sense of humor, but a sense of humor that doesn't feel 90s dated in a way that I thought it would coming back to it. And I just put on one episode to kind of get a flavor and I ended up watching like two or three episodes and it's just become something that I throw on at night now because it's such an enjoyable show. Um, so I wish we'd gotten a Blu-ray of this, but the complete series on DVD on two discs, it's just two seasons I think, um, is definitely worth your time, definitely worth picking up and uh, I'm glad that uh, Mill Creek put this out. So... Anyway, that was not short at all. That was way too long-winded, but that's all I got for this round of my collection update. Hopefully there is some stuff in here that is of interest to you. Uh, if not, I apologize. And I will talk to you guys very soon. Bye-bye.